unbelievable. The American Senate has asked for a criminal investigation into Goldman Sachs. This is worth a closer look. I'm astounded. A bank like Goldman Sachs, one of the most prestigious and influential banks in the world. The once untouchable financial firm is now on the receiving end of a subpoena from the Manhattan DA's office. The subpoena seeks information related to the recent report by the U.S. Senate on the firm's dealings before and after and during the financial crisis. It's a remarkable American Senate report accusing Goldman Sachs that sparked the prosecutor's investigation. Over 35,000 people in 32 countries work for Goldman Sachs. The head office is here in New York, and I was eager to find out what this place was like. No name, no plaque, no sign. It's almost like a secret society. The employees and ex-employees are, in fact, all sworn to secrecy. Goldman Sachs is officially an investment bank, but what kind of investments? Since 2008, a mass of articles has been published claiming the bank grew richer during the financial crisis, a crisis, it is alleged, Goldman Sachs helped create. They are also accused of betraying their clients and manipulating world trade prices. How much of this is true? Who benefits from these accusations? Is this bank really more powerful than the government? And there have been many books written describing how the bank acquired its immense power over 30 years. We spoke with senators, writers, financiers, journalists, bankers. All were kind enough to enlighten us. I wrote a letter to the president of Goldman Sachs asking for a meeting. While I wait for an answer, I take a look through the Business Insider's website. There are at least two new articles a week about Goldman Sachs on this site. One of the journalists is Katja Wachstel from Australia. I've only ever seen a small photo of her. I hope it'll be enough to recognize her. Katja feels uncomfortable being filmed in the office, so we head off to a restaurant for the interview. How many articles did you write? 50 to 100 articles about Goldman Sachs. But I update them constantly, so it could be, it could be more than that. But I think it's about, about that many. They're, they're the most... They're the, ba they're the bank that everybody wants to know about. They're the bank that everybody wants to read about, so... How come? I think it's because they're the best at the moment, although that's also up for debate. But in over the past decade, at least, they have been the number one bank. And I think that when you're number one, people are interested. There's something about the power. It's, it's, it's sexier. So the man on the street can't understand why Goldman would sell a product and then hedge against it. But if you're in the banking world, if you're in finance, it's totally normal. I don't, just, just because something is, we feel ethically wrong or we can't understand why, why anyone could, could do that doesn't mean that within that industry, amongst the people who know, it's common, it's, it's what they do. Goldman Sachs is certainly guilty of something, but I don't believe for a second that they're more guilty than other banks, I think that they're a scapegoat often. And that annoys me because I think that people don't delve into the activities of other banks as much. I think people are less willing to look at the activities of other executives or employees at those banks. And I think it's, it's, there's a reason Goldman's look, looked at. I just think that a lot of the time it's unfair. And if you went into the back offices of those other banks, it would look really ugly too. There's always a gap, I think, between moral and legal. 
and I think that that's something that the government and prosecutors are constantly trying to chase. And they'll, they're going to create a new law and they'll create new regulation. The banks are smart. The bankers are incredibly intelligent. They come from the best schools in the country. They know what they're doing. They'll, they'll get around it. Have you heard anything from Goldman? Goldman's press office just called. No meeting with the president or anyone else for that matter. One of the first things you learn when you start working at Goldman Sachs is that you must never speak about Goldman Sachs. Next on my investigation is John Cassidy from The New Yorker, who has been following Wall Street for 20 years. He compares the financial sector to Frankenstein's monster, a creature that went completely out of control. I asked him to talk about what he has learnt by observing investment banks like Goldman Sachs. Well, it turns out banks weren't banks, were they? I mean, that's what we've discovered. You're thinking of a bank as somewhere where you put your money on deposit and they give you a low return, perhaps 1%, perhaps 2%. You go back at the end of a couple of years, you take the money out. That's what banks were for 200 years. The banks you're talking about today are not banks in that sense at all. They're largely sort of speculative machines. They take the money that you put in there, but that's only part of what they've got. They also raise money on their own behalf. They issue their own bonds to scale up their investments, and then they invest in all sorts of things. Banks also now gamble, i.e. speculate, on their own account. They've turned into what are called investment banks, Wall Street banks. So the big French banks, for example, the big German banks, they have a subsidiary inside them, which to all intents and purposes is just the same as Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley. It's a Wall Street investment bank stuck inside what is supposed to be an old-fashioned retail bank. People are particularly fascinated by Goldman because they're widely seen to be the sort of quintessential Wall Street firm. For 10, 20 years, they've been seen as the number one firm. They hire the smartest people. They make the, sm the biggest profits, highest returns on equity, as they say on Wall Street. And they also have this incredible record of producing people who go on to higher office. So they're very close to people in government, not just in the US, but in the UK and other parts of the world. So Goldman Sachs for 10 or 20 years has been a source of envy to other people in the financial industry and also invariably they get involved in whatever the big story of the day is. Whenever there's a big blow up, you look around, Goldman, not always, but usually is involved some way or another. For 80 years, Goldman Sachs has always been behind every significant financial crisis, including arguably the worst so far, the Wall Street crash of 1929, when even Groucho Marx lost all his savings. Today, Goldman stocks millions of tons of aluminium and zinc to raise the prices. According to the Wall Street Journal, Goldman Sachs is advising their clients to bet on the financial collapse of Europe. Hello, any news? Yes, Goldman's press office has advised us to meet with Charles Ellis. He has written a book about Goldman. Charles Ellis is a financial strategist and a great admirer of Goldman Sachs. He has been collaborating with them for a long time and is the only person who agrees to defend them. He insists on meeting us at the club for Yale University alumni. His wife is the vice president of the university. It's like an old hotel with an immense library and a delicious buffet. How come you love them so much? I have a great deal of respect for the people. I've worked with them personally for nearly 40 years as a consultant. And when you're in a consulting work as I was in, you meet with the people away from the clients, backstage, or back in the kitchen, where real truth gets told. And over and over and over again, I watched how they made decisions about things that they really had to do well, and how beautifully they built up a, a fabulously talented, wonderfully capable organization. Do I think they've always been perfect? Certainly not. Do I think they have made small mistakes? Almost every day. Do I think they've made big mistakes? Yes. Almost every 25 years they make another huge mistake. Are they really a terrific organization? Even so? 
Yes. And would I be proud to have one of my children working there? Yes. And would I like it if I had gone to work there? Yes, I'd be very proud. It's amazing if you go back 10 years ago and you were to say anything negative about Goldman Sachs, people would shake their heads and say, you must be crazy. Everything about Goldman Sachs is just wonderful. Today, if you say anything good about Goldman Sachs, they shake their heads. They say, you must be crazy. I thought everything about Goldman Sachs was terrible. It's the same firm. Modest changes in size, yes. Some interesting changes in the business activities they do, yes. Some changes in some of the key people, of course. But is it basically the same firm? Absolutely. At last, we found a former Goldman Sachs employee who has agreed to be interviewed. He set up a website called Naked Capitalism. His name is Eve Smith. Much to my surprise, it turns out that Eve Smith is, in fact, a woman. <laughs> Knowing only too well how chauvinistic the financial world can be, Susan thought she would be far more credible if she used a man's name. The big change in behavior started in the 1980s, although really the foundation was set in 1970. All the firms used to be partnerships. The New York Stock Exchange rules required the firms to be partnerships. And if you're a partnership in the United States, you can lose all your money. In general, corporate America was much more conservative and proper. I mean, even though there was still bad behavior, there was some notion that there were limits to the bad behavior. In 1999, there's a revolution. Goldman Sachs is in need of cash and sells itself on the stock exchange in joint stock. Now the managers can no longer be held personally responsible should the bank lose any money. This is the root cause for the change in behavior. At the same time, laws that had forced the banks to act with a minimum of caution are abolished by President Clinton. In the past, people used to say Goldman Sachs was like a wise old owl. Today, it's treated like a vampire. What happened from the 1980s and much more in the 1990s was first in the 80s, the bond business grew to be much more important. And that continued into the 1990s. And it became much more important and much more profitable. Riskier, too, but bigger and more profitable. The second is that the derivatives business grew up. And the derivatives business is very lightly regulated. And that started becoming a very big business in the 1990s. And so these two areas that were very profitable and where the regulations were very low, um, and suddenly we're making a lot of money meant that you had traders become more important. And traders are predators. I mean, traders will take whatever they can from somebody else. You know, they, they operate by a kind of rule of the jungle that everybody out there is, you know, if, if, they, if, if somebody is foolish enough to buy something at a bad price, that's their problem. And so you have as these people become more powerful in the firm, that mentality starts to drive the firm more than it used to. I mean, for example, at Goldman, the, the traders call the people on the investment banking side socialists because they get paid on a team basis. Everything is backwards. You know, finance is supposed to be about, you know, first thing, it's supposed to be a service business. It's supposed to support industry. And it's supposed to help the economy grow. And therefore, it's, it, you know, they shouldn't take too much. You know, if, if they take too much, it's no longer a support. It's more like a parasite. But then now we have the second problem, that it's much more profitable to destroy rather than to make money, if you, if you, in the normal fashion. Does Goldman Sachs have any influence of the United States government? I think you'd be crazy to think that they didn't. The question is how much more influence do they have than other players? There's good reason to think they have quite a lot. I mean, you first, you, you obviously have all these famous names that have been, had had very prominent government positions. Of course, you've got you know, Bob Rubin and Hank Paulson being the most famous. Robert Rubin, who was head of Goldman Sachs, became Bill Clinton's finance minister. His successor, Henry Paulson, followed in his footsteps when G.W. Bush became president. In 2008, Henry Paulson organized the biggest bank rescue ever seen. 
and made sure that Goldman Sachs benefited as much as possible. When Barack Obama is elected, many managers at Goldman Sachs enter the White House and the government. While certain people become guardians of the market, this leaves the task of finding a fox to guard the hen house. And there's movement in the other direction too, as ministers and prosecutors head to Goldman Sachs. Their banking culture spreads across the whole world. Hundreds of them fill key positions. Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of Canada. Olusugan Aganga, the minister of trade for Nigeria. Ben Broadbent, one of the managers of the Bank of England. They all came from Goldman. As for the new president of the European Central Bank, Mario Draghi, he too is a former vice president of Goldman Sachs Europe. I learn a demonstration is being planned inside one of the Goldman banks. This particular bank is earning serious money, but pays no tax. Follow the road here. Everyone get behind. Charge for your back. The only news crew present is from Russia. The Russians love it when anything goes wrong in America. because of these financial institutions. They are making billions from the wars. Feed the poor, not the war. Yeah. 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 I want to meet the journalists of the New York Times. They were the first to lift the lid on the Goldman Sachs fraud. Gretchen Morganson is finishing off a book, but Louise Story agrees to meet us. It's because of these two journalists that Goldman Sachs was convicted in 2010 and forced to pay a record $550 million fine for misleading their investors. Almost immediately, Goldman Sachs saw the value of its stock plummet 15%. How do you feel when Goldman Sachs says that their share might go down because of you and other journalists? Goldman shares do not go down because of journalists or stories or articles. They go down because of things that Goldman does or because of things that the government does. What we do is we tell the stories and we look for the facts. When the financial markets ran into grave trouble, there wasn't enough money for everyone. And what you saw at Goldman as well as some other banks is you saw them make some decisions that benefited Goldman but did not benefit their clients. And it, it occurred in all different sorts of ways. So one way that it occurred was with a hospital in Pittsburgh. And that hospital had bought something called auction rate securities from Goldman. And these are basically short-term investments that are supposed to roll over in auctions all the time. But that market dried up at the beginning of 2008, and Goldman was actually the first bank to pull out, helping it to dry up. But one of its customers was a hospital in Pittsburgh, and that hospital had asked Goldman months before should we leave this market? And Goldman said to stay. And then when the market dried up, that customer alone was left to bear the loss. At the same time that Goldman was marking down these mortgage bonds, Goldman had its own position, its own negative bet on the mortgage market. Its customers did not know that Goldman was not a neutral broker. The more it marked its customers down, the more that short negative bet benefited Goldman. At the end of 2006, they had a big long position, which means Goldman was betting on the future of the housing market. And in the beginning of 2007, it was very hard to get rid of all of that position. They got rid of a lot, but they could not get rid of all. And so what they did was they built what they called the big short, which was a big negative bet that helped offset a lot of that long. And in 2007, it led to a substantial profit for Goldman. Now, Goldman would point to some losses in 2008, but I've been told by a lot of my sources that then they made profits on it in 2009 and they won't release those numbers. But the bottom line is, Goldman had a big short. Other banks did not have the big short. Other banks spiraled and suffered and bled, but Goldman survived strong and much better because of this negative bet that they put in place even while their customers suffered. I also wanted to ask her about AIG, the world's biggest insurance company that went bankrupt. 
What role did Goldman Sachs play? Did Louise have any idea? Every story I read, AIG are just a puppet in their hand. How come? Well, AIG got itself into all these very complex insurance deals with a lot of big banks, including Goldman Sachs. And what AIG gave them was insurance policies, essentially, that said, if those mortgage securities decrease in value, we, AIG, will pay you. Just like, you know, if your house burns down, the insurance company might pay for it. So these were insurance policies on financial instruments. And what happened, of course, is the mortgage securities did collapse. And as they collapsed, Goldman was the first and foremost to demand all this cash from AIG. It was saying, give us more money, give us more money. These are going down in value. Remember, at the same time, Goldman had its big short on. So Goldman profited on its short. It demanded cash from AIG. The market did go down. And all of that cash drained the life out of AIG. And that's why in the fall of 2008, the federal government had to bail out AIG. The only thing is at the time in 2008, it was kept a secret that all that money went to the banks. It only came out later that this had been sort of a backdoor bailout to the banks through AIG. And in fact, if Goldman was really so smart, they should have realized that hurting AIG really was going to be very destructive and it was also going to hurt all the other banks, which would in the end hurt them. You know, how could they be so um, short-sighted if they're so smart as to not understand that trying to, you know, if, if, you're, if you're on a uh, sinking boat, everybody's going to sink. And if, even if you think what you're doing is going to save yourself, what they did basically made the boat sink even sink faster. Let's go back to the money wagered on the collapse of the housing market. The scandal was so huge that representatives of Goldman Sachs were summoned to the Senate. Edward Kaufman was part of the commission that publicly interrogated the executives. He is one of the few senators who did not take Goldman Sachs's money to fund his election campaign. He still can't understand why none of the bankers were imprisoned. We had Goldman Sachs, uh, Lloyd Blankfein, a number of the top uh, people in Goldman Sachs came and testified and told a, um, a very hard to believe story. That wasn't an indication you want to get out of that business? When you, tell, uh, when you tell me get out of the business, I get, you know, Senator, I don't, I don't know if, I, I don't know what exactly. But you see, it's hard for the, for the American people to believe that people this smart really never kind of decided that this thing was going south in a big way. Senator, I heard your, uh, your earlier remarks right. as well. I think, we're, I, I think we're, not that, we're not that smart. Never once he, he said Goldman Sachs decided and announced and, and put together an investment strategy based on the fact that that housing market was, was failing. If they, they can be selling an investment to someone and saying this is a great investment at the same time uh, selling a, uh, a, a derivative that would protect them its insurance against it. It's like me selling you a car saying it was great and as it goes out the door I'm buying insurance that the car is going to crash because I know the brakes are no good on the car. They haven't put in a case together against Goldman Sachs uh, any more cases uh, and the fact that not a single person is going to jail is a total complete um, is frankly is very 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 disheartening and discouraging and so far we've seen a, a trend that the regulators are ruling more and more in favor of the big banks <clears throat> not ruling in favor of just the common person the regular person and the investor and by the way some of these investments are very investors that are getting hurt by this are very rich people this is not just rich versus poor many of the people that are suffering from the high frequency trading are suffering from the naked short selling suffering from the, they, they, they cover the whole gamut of investors in the United States so it isn't just the rich versus the poor. It basically is the big banks versus everybody else. And one of the things that happened in the United States was after uh, September 11, uh, we moved a whole lot of our FBI agents off of financial fraud uh, into terrorism, which we should have done. It was the right thing to do. But uh, we should have filled in those FBI spots, and we didn't. 
Well, self-regulation doesn't work. It doesn't work in the financial industry. It doesn't work on the streets. You can't. It doesn't work in sports. Can you imagine in a, in a sporting event if uh, you said, look, you know, the referees are getting in the way. They keep slowing down the game. They're blowing their whistles. What we need to do is we need to get rid of all the referees. Can you imagine what would happen in a football game uh, if, in fact, you put all the referees off the, off the field? I mean, I wouldn't want to be in the middle of that field about five minutes into that game. And essentially, that's their argument. The same way the police in the streets. Clearly, what concerns me is that these engineers are putting together uh, uh, machines, computers that operate at such an incredible high rate of speed, and we really have no idea. We have no, no idea. Do you hear me? No idea what's going on in these markets because they are trading at such a high rate of speed, and we cannot monitor those speeds. Uh, neither the CFTC nor the Securities Exchange Commission in the United States have the capability to determine what's going on in terms of these high frequency trading. That is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly dangerous. Only 20% of the exchanges are treated by the New York Stock Exchange that might, anyway, close in a few years' time. Today, most of the transactions are made outside of the stock exchange controls directly between the computers of one bank and another, discreetly and at the speed of light. And when the price of wheat, of coffee, of soybeans and petrol doubles or triples, it's not because of the fluctuations in demand or supplies of stocks, but because Goldman Sachs and their competitors use rumors they themselves invent to make money on the rise or fall of prices. Today, Goldman is hosting its stockholders. The General Assembly will take place in the other tower, the New Jersey Tower on the other side of the Hudson River. Many stockholders say it's to discourage them from attending. A guard threatens to have me arrested if I get any closer, and even some of the stockholders aren't welcome. The Jersey City Police, where this meeting is taking place, called our organization and said that we had our names were on a list that had been given to them by Goldman Sachs as potential troublemakers at their annual meeting. <laughs> Goldman Sachs, pay your tax. Don't balance budget on the people's backs. Goldman Sachs, pay your tax. Don't balance budget on the people's backs. Goldman Sachs, pay your tax. Don't balance budget on the people's back. At the exit, we meet one of the stockholders. She manages the investments of many religious communities. Goldman Sachs is, uh, executives are among the richest people in the world. And there are one billion plus people in the world at the bottom of the pyramid, which means they are suffering from poverty and mainly food insecurity. And because Goldman Sachs is at the heart of the financial, economic, and speculative uh, communities, we believe that that is truly affecting our global community in a way that is not sustainable. So we are uh, looking that executive compensation can be seriously addressed and our global community can become more sustainable. I can understand why she's disappointed. In 2010, Goldman Sachs's profits fell by 37 percent, while the salaries of the top five managers tripled. There is a website that highlights all the articles and television programs that are critical of Goldman Sachs. I'm curious about who runs it and decide to head to Florida to see Larry Rubinoff. Larry was head of a mortgage lending office for 20 years until the market collapsed. Today he spends his time keeping the website up to date. Goldman Sachs tried to have the site banned, but since Larry was not making any profit from it, the law says he's free to carry on. My, my hair is okay. A little is missing. <laughs> what is your motivation? My involvement stems from my anger of what the banking system did to create the economic crisis, the global economic crisis, hurting literally millions and millions of people, primarily middle class people. Purely out of greed, they motivated themselves to take advantage of little people.
Goldman Sachs, did they suffer from this subprime problem? Goldman Sachs didn't suffer at all. Goldman Sachs has had its best years since the mortgage meltdown and since the worldwide economic crisis. Goldman Sachs has come out on top. They knew the mortgages would fail. They never told anyone. They were very instrumental in this crisis that the entire world has gone through. They paid rating agencies to give false ratings on these issues that led investors to believe they were safe. Countries na and entire nations, municipalities, unions, they duped everyone. After the very last Wall Street reform, do you expect some benefit? Ab absolutely none. Business is going on in Wall Street and with the banks as usual. Derivatives are still being tr sold and traded. Mortgage-backed securities are still being created and sold and traded. We just don't know what ratings are put on them. But they're doing as much now, if not more, than they were before. So I see absolutely no change. How come our Western government are so weak? It's perhaps that Goldman Sachs and other banks and financial institutions have a great deal of power over the government. It's not that the government is so weak. It's possibly that those that control our finances and our money are a little bit stronger. There was a quote by a gentleman that created the concept of the central banking system, what we know here in this country as the Federal Reserve System. His name was Mayor Rothschild. He said, let me control the money of a nation, and I care not who makes its laws. If you think about that, it's a very profound statement. If the banks in Goldman Sachs can control all the money, they can pretty much control the governments and the laws within those governments. How come there are not more people revolting? I think people, people especially in this country, have a fear. They have a fear of retribution. They become sheep. They're being led to the slaughter, and they don't believe, they truly don't believe in their hearts that they can fight against these institutions. There was a surprise waiting for me in New York, but there were no cameras to witness it. But there were two journalists. It's rare to see demonstrations on Wall Street, and yet up to 10,000 people took part to peacefully express their anger. Not against Goldman specifically, but against the big banks in general, and a rival of Goldman Sachs in particular. I hear about an MEP who is outraged after discovering the financial experts that advise the European Commission are actually lobbyists being paid for by the big banks. Goldman Sachs, no Goldman Sachs does not set out to ensure that the economy functions well, neither do they concern themselves with the development of businesses. 
On the contrary, they can earn a lot of money when things aren't going so smoothly. So their know-how is to position themselves well, uh, but also to influence the markets or influence the deciders and the laws so that the bets they have made are won. So, for example, when you have the option of betting on the decline in value of Greek bonds, if those bonds do indeed decline, you make money. Then you might issue a sort of press release to say, oh dear, the situation really is catastrophic in Greece, and it's worsening every day. And then you have other people playing their role, in the markets for instance, who will start selling. If people sell, the prices go down, and that's when Goldman Sachs wins, because they've put their money on a change in the prices. They need opacity, they need a fiscal paradise, they need banking secrecy, and they absolutely need for the rules surrounding financial transactions not to be transparent. So all these products that have been made over the last 20 years, what we call financial innovation, that is what is at stake when the risks increase. So honestly, what should we really call them? Honestly, we should call them time bombs, because we're creating more risks than we're getting rid of. The finance and the lobbying of the finances is to say, we are taking into account the risks. We have the risks covered. We are hedging the risks. We are mediating the risks. In reality, it's the complete opposite. They are creating more risks than they are protecting themselves against. As I was leaving, I discovered Goldman Sachs is also being sought by the American Federal Reserve. In 2009, one of their subsidiaries, Lytton Loan Servicing, illegally evicted millions of families. The AFR considers Lytton Loan Servicing to be guilty of, quote, neglect, abnormal practices, even of inappropriate behavior. For years, Jean-Francois Guéraud has investigated financial crimes. He has just finished writing a book on the subject, and I asked him to explain the mechanics of it all. The bankers that distributed these subprime loans, said to be predators or liars, knew only too well that someday or another these loans would literally strangle the more vulnerable members of American society. There is even a phrase that is even more revealing and true to the hideousness and toxicity of these loans. The financiers talked about neutron loans, comparing them to neutron bombs. Now, neutron bombs are designed to destroy people but leave the buildings intact. So these subprimes would someday destroy American households that have been set up to be strangled but leave the houses themselves intact so they could be brought back by the banks, all of this consciously and voluntarily. From the 1970s in the United States, a balance was established where there was a transfer of power between the financial world on Wall Street, New York, and the political institution in Washington. Little by little, American finance became more and more significant in the American system, and then it gradually began to harness the political power. Are there people above Goldman Sachs, and do they owe any explanation to anyone? You might believe that impunity causes crime, so we think that impunity is a permanent incentive to commit more crimes. This can be true for a bank robber, but then again, this is also true for thieving bankers. And this is the American system's main problem, because it never really enforces a punishment, it constantly encourages behavior that is untrustworthy, at the very least. On the other hand, when deregulation is actually put into place dogmatically, and in a fundamentalist way, it does indeed cause crime. In other words, it contributes to the constant incitement to commit fraud and systematically create opportunities for fraud. Deregulation is said to be a constant incitement to commit fraud. What does a renowned American journalist like Dan Rather think about this? He was the star anchorman of CBS News for 24 years and continues to independently present news programs. Aged 80, he is still tremendously successful. This is the tale of Olga Ooze. Denture Pace gave her the blues. Yeah, until at last she found... Six this is what we have to understand about a company like Goldman Sachs and about Wall Street in general. It is gambling. It is a big casino. But, and this is very important, at the best casinos, you walk in the door, you know you're gambling. However, you have confidence that the casino will abide by the casino rules. 
No dealing from the bottom of the deck. No having cards up the sleeve. The roulette wheel is an honest roulette wheel. It's gambling, but it's, if there's such a phrase as honest gambling, you know the rules, you know the risks, we know the di dice were loaded, we know the roulette wheel was fixed. However, up to and including the time you and I are talking here, I think there's been only one really big Wall Street operator who's been brought to justice on criminal charges. Under our law and our regulations, they've been brought up under civil charges, so they pay a fine. The fine looks big in the paper. X firm pays $100 million. Chump change to these guys. As long as, it's only, as long as they can only suffer monetary losses, I fear they'll continue to do it. But if you start sending some to prison, and legitimately so, and our government, both Republican and Democratic now, our governments have a lot to answer for. It's inelegant to say so, but what's developed in the United States of America, not this country alone, but it has developed here, is that big government is in bed with very big business, very big corporations, huge international conglomerate corporations, including but not limited to banks. So they're in bed with one another. The big corporations make huge campaign contributions. Footnote, our last presidential campaign, when all is said and done, costs about $2 billion. That's with a B, $2 billion. So while some people give to political campaigns altruistically for the right reasons, by and large, the people who give the money to the politicians to run their election campaigns expect to get something. Are they then the masters of the world? No, they are just the best. The best at creating a detonation powerful enough to cause the system to implode. To evaluate this worldwide danger, I need to find someone who can give an objective point of view. Chris Hedges is a former war correspondent and Pulitzer Prize winner, one of the few American intellectuals to demonstrate against the digressions of the big banks. A few years ago, he even resigned from the New York Times in order to carry out his investigations without restriction. His vision of the world goes way beyond just finance. What is specific about Goldman Sachs? Because partners at Goldman Sachs are pushed out of the institution at a fairly young age, uh, they gravitate into the political system. So there are a huge number of former partners uh, and even heads of Goldman Sachs who have achieved direct political power. Uh, and really, it is fair to say that it is impossible in this country to vote against the interests of Goldman Sachs. How big is the power of Goldman Sachs? Well, Goldman Sachs has the power to bring down economies, as they have in Greece. Um, it's all about bond ratings. Uh, and uh, when they declare a particular government insolvent, um, the consequences are drastic because they force the government in order to continue to be able to borrow money to impose the kind of austerity measures that have crippled Greek society uh, and which are crippling the United States. Um, we're all hostage to this game of speculation. You have seen the, the Senate hearing, what do you think? Political theater. Um, as soon as the lights go out and the cameras leave, these people all go to lunch. Uh, nobody achieves political power in this country without the backing of the financial sector. It, since the collapse of 2008, it is that these institutions are untouchable. We can't do anything uh, to stop them. Uh, they have looted the U.S. Treasury uh, and are engaging in the same kind of speculation, uh, casino capitalism, that they engaged in uh, before the bubble deflated wiping out $17 trillion in wages and savings of 
small shareholders and ordinary Americans. Uh, you know, these people are criminals. In the 17th century, speculators were hung. Uh, and here, uh, every single institution, from the press to universities, to the courts, to the legislative bodies, to the executive branch of government, dance to the tune that they play. And there's absolutely no way uh, that ordinary citizens can fight back. There is no mechanism within the formal structures of power by which we can fight back. We live not in a democracy, but what the political philosopher Sheldon Woolen calls a system of inverted totalitarianism. And by that, he means it's not classical totalitarianism. It doesn't revolve around a demagogue or a charismatic leader, but finds its expression in the anonymity of the corporate state. We're being destroyed financially, morally, politically, and economically. And the institutions that do it, and maybe the crown institution that is doing it, is Goldman Sachs. They know no limits. They turn everything into a commodity that they exploit until exhaustion or collapse, which is why the environmental crisis is intimately twinned with the economic crisis. Now, the death of the American empire is not a tragedy. It's probably a good thing. Uh, it's just how we're dying that is so frightening, because we're lashing out like a wounded animal. And, um, you know, empires, the tyranny empires uh, impose abroad, they always bring home. They always impose at home. I mean, Thucydides and Plutarch wrote about that in ancient Athens. Um, Athenian democracy was slaughtered by the Athenians. And uh, we're doing exactly the same thing. Uh, civilizations uh, from Easter Island to the Ottoman Empire to uh, the collapse of Imperial Russia, they they always uh, exhaust their own potential and their own resources. The danger is that um, this time it's global. We bring the whole planet down with us. There is nowhere left to migrate to.